guests who are tuning in. Thank you so much for being here. And let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility partnerships. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And TC family, it is so good to see you. Okay, you may be seated. Yes. All righty then. Y'all look good. Even those of you sitting at home in your pajamas. I can see you. We've got... Te no, I'm just kidding. I can't see you. Well, thank you so, so much. So we're walking through a series called Feast, and we're going to learn how to feast on certain attributes and character formational aspects of what the gospel creates in us. The gospel is good news that sin, death, and evil has been defeated by King Jesus, and he sweeps us into his kingdom with his presence and his power. This time of season, teenagers, is what's called the season of Lent. For about 16, 1700 years, Christians throughout the world have celebrated Lent. It's a 40-day period in which we prepare for Easter. Easter is the resurrection. Young adults, if Jesus did not raise from the dead physically and bodily in a miraculous way, then what we believe is not true. And we believe that there is not only substantial evidence that it's true, but there's internal evidence that it's true. People go, how you know it's true? Well, number one, I just talked to him just now, and I know it's true. And number two, historically, he has risen from the dead. And so Easter is the high point in celebration, and Lent is a time of preparation, but also a time of self-examination. Now, let's pause here. Um, when we say words like self-examination, there are some of us in here who really dig that because it's an opportunity for you to beat yourself up. Because you've been trained as a child that, well, if you yell at me, I'll go harder. And if you shame me, I'll go har harder. And all it does is it makes you a narcissist and it makes you mean. And also you have a tendency to hide sin. Typically, a lot of times people who are very egregious towards sinners and don't give grace is because they're hiding the same sin. Can I get amen? amen. This self-examination is a time in which we go, Lord, I want my heart to be all of you. I want to give myself wholly to you. I want you to have all of me. And what you and I will discover is that's actually what we were created for. And so we're using the metaphor of Feast. Last week, I told you that uh, one of my favorite places to eat, if not the favorite place to eat, is called Papado's Seafood Kitchen. And I describe, amen, can I get amen? I personally believe that Papado's Seafood Kitchen will be in the new heavens and new earth. I read that in the book of Revelation, chapter <laughs> Derwin, verse 7. Um, and, I, and, you know, so last week I was with Vicki, and she's working on her master's at, at Wheaton. And, you know, I wanted to be with her because I like to be with my girl, but there's also a Papa Do's in Chicago area. And so we made sure to go on a little date to Papa Do's, and I got me some black and catfish Appaloosas, and it was good, 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 good. When you think of a feast... Maybe when you were young, maybe around the holiday season, maybe with your grandparents, depending upon the culture you come from. So I'm from the west side of San Antonio, Texas. This may gross some of y'all out. I don't eat this anymore. But feasting back in the day, Thanksgiving, Christmas time with family, granny, meant chitlins. Some of y'all don't even, some of y'all be like, uh, y'all too bougie to admit you used to eat some chitlins with some vinegar and some hot sauce. Some of the white people that grew up with black people eat. Okay, I don't eat them anymore because they're not healthy. But you know what I remember most, though? Not the bad smell of the chitlins. <laughs> my grandmother. Yeah. My family. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something about feasting. It's not just the food, but it's the loving company you're with. Well, well Jesus wants us to feast on his grace in his loving company, in the company of brothers and sisters, but also, you ready, in the company of sinners. Now, in today's language, people go, oh, don't call me a sinner. It's actually 
beautiful to be recognized as a sinner because now you know what the problem is. Okay, so for many of you guys know, um, I got a bad back. I have an L5 bulging disc, spinal stenosis. That means my spine is sinking in. Like, it's, hit, it's hurting, like, right now, right? And so I've lived with that chronic pain. But for years, I didn't know. What's worse, not knowing or knowing what the problem is? Well, when you recognize, hold on a second, I'm a sinner. I'm separated from God. Now I know what the problem is, and I know the Savior who can save me. So it's actually good, but it becomes bad when you and I go into the world as religious Pharisees instead of Christians. What we're going to do is we're going to look at feasting on God's grace. And we're going to look at a story that is familiar if you have read the Bible. Please, don't ever get too familiar with the Bible. The goal is not simply to study the Bible. It is to let the unsearchable riches of God in the Bible study me and you. God is infinite. He's inexhaustible. There will never come a day that you go, wow, I didn't get nothing out of that. The only way we don't get nothing out of it is if we didn't put our heart into it to receive. And for those of you new to the faith, you're like, what are you talking about? All right, get ready. We're going to jump in on John chapter 8, and we're going to hear about a story about a woman shamed and caught in the act of adultery, and the religious leaders known as the scribes, those were the PhDs, the scholars of the Jewish world, along with the Pharisees, those were the working class religious group whose job was to get all of Israel to live the Ten Commandments. Why? So that the, so that the Savior could come back and not save the Romans, get them out of the promised land. They wanted to make Israel great again. Jesus came to show the world he's a great Savior. So let's pick up the story, and let's use our metaphor, feast. Teenagers, young young adults, check this out. Feasting on grace means Jesus is teaching us how God the Father saves and frees us from condemnation. So let me pause here. Early on, when Vicki and I were exploring who Christ was, when I was with the cults, we got invited to a team Bible study with the chaplain. We went in, the chaplain asked us questions, and then the chaplain asked me if one of my teammates was saved. And Vicki and I looked at each other and went, oh, yeah, yeah. Then at the end of the Bible study, we went in the car and we said, what does saved mean? Remember, we didn't grow up in church. So number one, be careful about using language that non-Christians don't know. So theologically, what are we saved from? The Greek word is sozo, and it's like a dramatic rescue. Jesus is rescuing us, one, from the penalty of sin, which is condemnation, eternal separation. Two, he's saving us from the power of sin. He's saving us from a purposeless life. He's saving us from idolatry, the worship of false gods. He is saving us from being his enemies. You get it? So when people ask you, well, what are we saved from? Don't just say, oh, saved from hell, because some people are going through hell right now. They need to know that Jesus came to give life and to give it abundantly, which is the forgiveness of sins, which is grace, but also he turns us into the temple of his Holy Spirit. We become a fountain of his his unending grace. And he frees us from condemnation. Condemnation will destroy our souls. Uh, Let's go to the text. Now, when you read the Bible... Make sure you read it slowly. Let it, let it marinate in your soul. At dawn, he got on up. He got up early. And he appeared again in the temple courts. Stop. Whenever you see temple courts in the Bible, circle it. Because for Jewish people, the temple is where the presence of God was in the holies of holies. Yahweh, the one true living God of the universe, was in the holies of holies. And Jesus has this uncanny habit of doing things at the temple to show the people that God ain't in there. He's in front of you. But religion blinds you to that. When I say religion, I mean it in a negative sense of trying to be self-righteous to reach God. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And it's going to be a story about being freed from condemnation. Um, Here's the thing about condemnation. All of us have it. 
even if you're not a follower of Christ, we all are dealing with condemnation. Why? Because it's hardwired into our fabric. Case in point, if we don't believe that we are, why is there so much self-help stuff? Like self-help books are proliferating the world and they still ain't helping. Condemnation says you had better get better. You have failed. You are no good. No one will love you. They will leave you too. You're not worth it. And the reality is, is because we have sinned, and that means to miss the mark, because we know we're not perfect, it's there. And we work really, really hard to get rid of it. it kind of the, for, for us as Americans, um, the way we try to get rid of condemnation is through achievement. Like, if I can get the right job, I can be free. Um, if I can get the right girl, the right guy, I can be free. If, if I can have the right status and I can have this, and here's, and here's the messed up part. The more you achieve, the worse the condemnation gets because it didn't help you. Um, matter of fact, why is it important that we get free from condemnation? Because it not only affects us, but it affects those around us. You can tell when someone lives under condemnation, and here's how you can tell. They condemn other people. They're angry. They're loud. Let me pause here. Listen, for some of you dads and moms, you are yelling at your kids, and most of it is your own condemnation of thinking you're not a good parent. Can I let you off uh, the hook right now? God was a perfect parent, and look what happened to Adam and Eve. How good do you think you're going to do? Now, I know you didn't read all your little Christian self-help books and all that stuff. Listen, God loves your kids more than you can ever love them. And the way you're going to serve them is not through condemnation. Shame does not motivate. It causes you to hide when you need help. Matter of fact, some psychologists in psychology today wrote this. A punitive, constant, inner critical voice can cause psychological harm. The greater the level of self-criticism, that's why in our theology is love God completely, love yourself correctly, love your neighbors compassionately, and the way you do that is by discovering the grace of God. The greater the probability of having or developing psychological disorder like depression, eating disorders, bipolar disorder, and borderline personality disorder. The dark powers from hell are not playing with us. They want to destroy us. And one of the ways that they do it is not just through irreligion, but through religion that says God accepts you based on your righteousness, based on what you do. Here's the problem. How do you know when you've done enough? And if you are doing enough, why do you need Jesus? Oh, but I got some good news though. Check this out. This is Romans chapter eight, verses one and two. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, I'm going to read it again because I'm not a smart man, Janai. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let me pause here. If you follow Jesus, there's a supernatural miracle that takes place. Somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit puts us in the person of Jesus. That's why the Bible says we are the body of Christ. And because Jesus is holy, because Jesus is blameless, because Jesus is free from condemnation, if you follow Jesus, then you too are free from condemnation. And if that's true, why do we still live condemned? It's because we don't think about Jesus enough, we think too much about ourselves. This is true. I'm not going to call God a liar. And when the inner critic comes, guess what you do? You ready, teenagers? Here's what you do. Don't have the conversation. Say, shut up. I'm listening to Jesus. I know people think I'm out of my mind when I'm driving my car and the inner critic comes and I'm like, we, ain't even, we are not having this conversation. Let me tell you why. Because I'm washed in the blood. I'm forgiven. I'm righteous. I'm justified. I'm a temple of the spirit. I am loved by God. You've got to preach to yourself. <laughs> by the way, hold on, hold on. You already are preaching to yourself. I'm no good. 
man, I did it again. They're going to do me just like them. Many of us have set ourselves up to fail before we even got to where we're going. Because, you ready? Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life and has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law, the Ten Commandments, is like looking in the mirror and going, gosh, I got a lot of wrinkles. Let me put a little makeup on it. Grace is God saying, don't even look in the mirror. I'm going to make you a whole new you. And now look in the mirror and guess what you see? Jesus. That's what it means to be in Christ. Here's the thing about God's grace. It's not for the proud. It's not for the religious. It's not for people who think too highly of themselves. One of the weirdest things when I first became a follower of Christ and then a pastor, a church started growing, people go, I hope you don't get big headed. I'm like, dude, I used to play in stadiums with 90,000 people. I've been on TV since I'm 17. Like, really? And I'm like, whose word is it? Jesus. Whose spirit is it? The Father's. Whose people are they? Jesus's. What do I got to boast about? God strips us of everything and rebuilds us back up that the only thing we can boast of is his grace is enough. His grace is amazing. His mercy is enough. (laughs) Guys, I don't meet a lot of Christians like that. I hope we're a congregation like that. I don't meet a lot of Christians that you, every time you press them, Jesus comes out because he's the boast of their life. Feasting on grace, teenagers, means this. Jesus challenges self-righteous religious people with how he saves sinners. All right, let's get to the meat of the text. The teachers of the law. So this right here is what's called the scribes. Once again, they were the scholars, the PhDs, and the Pharisees. The Pharisees get a bad billing. Not all Pharisees were bad. Not all scribes were, were, were bad. The Pharisees were a group of Jewish men of about 6,000. The word Pharisee means separate one. They believed that if they could get the nation of Israel to live the Ten Commandments plus the 603 more from the first five books of the Bible, totaling 613, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, would come back, beat up the Romans, kick them out, and the promised land would be there. So their intentions, for the most part, were good, but they were going about it the wrong way. When you and I try to do something good without God, it turns bad. Some of you right now, you're trying to get your kids to be saved or your husband, and you like put the little Christian book by his nightstand. Like you're just pestering people. No, no, God's grace goes before us. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Uh, Can we pause here for a moment? Let's continue the text. Watch this. In the law of Moses commanded us, to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Couple things, number one, number one. Where was the man? If they caught her in the act, I've been married for almost 32 years and got two children's. I don't know how quickly he moved, but he must have been very fast. (laughs) Now, I'm making light of this, but what if he was actually one of the Pharisees or scribes? So in the ancient world, teenagers, um, in the Jewish world as well as the Greco-Roman world, women did not have laws, so they could be treated any type of way, basically. The law didn't apply to them. They were less than quote-unquote men, and so there was a lot of horrendous abuse. Number two, number two, self-righteous religious people will use human beings to try to make a 
point. They had no interest in forgiveness. They had no interest in justice. They only had an interest in promoting their religious bigotry and the defeat of this Nazarene who was doing things that only Yahweh could do. They used her for their own point. Don't do that on social media. Don't do that online. Stop jumping in on stuff. You don't know what the story is. And you're, you, that's slander, and God's going to hold you like you know the story. You was there. You saw it happen. Here's something that will help you tremendously. It's called mind your own business. <laughs> you ain't got to comment on everything. Like, like, really, you an expert in everything? It's amazing. I sp I've spent most of my adult life becoming a New Testament scholar in a little bit of area. And it's amazing how people challenge me. I'm like, dude, you can't even spell Greek language. <laughs> Humility. You don't have to comment on everything, especially stuff that ain't your business. Men, number three, we are called to protect women. Not because they're weak. They're not. They're made in the image of God and they're valuable. They're not to be used as tools. They're our sisters. They're our mothers. Now listen. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, stop, stop. Don't think your porn is just you. Do you know how many women and men are in sex trafficking who aren't doing it because they want to? It's not just you. You need to be healed. You need God's grace. Let's be set free. Let's be men. Let's be men. Let's be men. We need some men to rise up. Now listen, time out, time out. I ain't talking about because you got a little old beard. Everybody grow a beard now. That don't make you a man. You know what makes you a man? Getting on the cross and sacrificing your life for somebody else and something greater. Not being selfish, but being cruciform, sacrificial. That's what it looks like to be a man. They were not men. They used this poor woman, whoever she is, to catch Jesus in a trap. <sighs> Which, by the way, trying to catch Jesus in a trap is like trying to drink the Pacific Ocean with a straw. Uh, little Pharisees and scribes were playing checkers. Jesus was playing eternal chess. Where did they get this from anyway? Leviticus 20, verse 10. This is in the Old Testament. This is immediately after the children of Israel are set free from slavery in Egypt. And so God, Yahweh, is building this community called Israel. Why? Because the Savior is going to come. If these people blow it, then the Savior of the world does not come. And so God relentlessly is going to bring Jesus into the world. And so he creates a society and says, listen, I'm forming you. I've set you free. Now just obey me out of love and grace. If a man commits adultery with a married woman, if he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. I don't know how many affairs there were in ancient Israel. He's like, what's up, girl? She's like, mm-mm, ain't going to stone me to death. <laughs> All right, now watch this. Watch this. What's really happening here? Uh, the Jewish law demanded the execution of this woman, but Rome had removed capital jurisdiction from Jewish courts, except for temple violations. Thus, the Jewish leaders test whether Jesus will reject the Jewish law compromising his nationalistic Jewish following or reject Roman rule, which will allow them to accuse him to the Romans. New Testament's Craig Scott, uh, Keener broke that down. So in San Antonio, where I grew up, and if you're my age and you're from Texas, you probably know this term, they wanted to put him in a trick bag. And a trick bag means whatever you do, you lose. Because once again, they're not looking for truth. They want to dismantle this man. Feasting on grace means this, teenagers. Jesus is the writer of the law and the gracious judge who is merciful to repentant law breakers. Watch how beautiful this is. But 
Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So we have Jesus. The religious establishment's like, oh, we got him now. And Jesus, like, he just gets down and he starts writing. So they continued questioning him. But they kept questioning him and he straightened up. So he's writing, they're questioning him. Oh, we got him now. And he straightens up and he says, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. You could hear pop, pop, stones dropping from the oldest to the youngest. I like this. Again, he stooped down and was writing on the ground. Why was Jesus writing on the ground? Let's skedaddle over to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. When the Lord, and whenever you see Lord capitalized in the Old Testament, that's Yahweh. We learned about my name is. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stab, uh, stone tablets. This is the law, the Ten Commandments. He gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. How ironic is it you have scholars who've spent their whole life studying the law and the one who wrote it is not only right in front of you, but he's right in front of you in the temple doing the things that Yahweh could only do and their religion blinded them to him. Hey, Transformation Church, please don't let this political season blind you to Jesus. Please don't. Please don't. Every four years, people on the left, all of a sudden, politically, we're Christians. People on the right, oh yeah, we're Christians. Please do not let this political season divide you from King Jesus. An elephant did not save you, a donkey did not save you. The church of Jesus Christ has, list, has, has been around for 2,000 years and will be around when America and Russia and everywhere else is long gone and forgotten about. The throne and the kingdom of God will rule and reign. Our allegiance is to Jesus. No one in the White House, in Congress, in Senate is going to save any of us. We are in the saving business with our king. You do know that most Christians who've ever lived don't know what a Democrat or a Republican is, right? You do know your brothers and sisters around the world have no clue what a Republican or Democrat is, right? Why is it that we bow down so hard to the elephant and donkey? You know why? Because we've lost faith in the power of the Lamb. Here at Transformation Church, we're going to be unified with Jesus. We're going to look to the one who wrote the law and who's repentant. And we're going to look to the Lamb, and we're going to be his people, and we are going to be about his business. Now, people go, well, pastor, should I vote? Of course you should. I'm going to vote. I'm going to walk up in there like, <laughs> guys, hold on. Historically, people like me, you know how hard it was for us to vote? You know how many people were hung and lynched so I could vote? Well, I'm going to vote, but my vote is secondary to the kingdom of God. Yeah. And you know what? Hey, l listen, uh, we've had people leave, well, you're not Democrat, you're not Republican. Where does that say I got to be that in the Bible? I'm a Christian. And, and so, l listen, this is who we are here. And my job is to train us. Let me say, say this. If you don't want your children to be like any one of the political candidates, <laughs> well... In the midst of that moment, the lawgiver is also the grace giver to those who are repentant. Let's look at Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. 
This is the Apostle Paul, a Jewish man, writing, and he says this, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. Notice, it doesn't say when the cultural warriors appeared. It says when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. Are you amazed that you're a Christian? Like, like, have you taken it for granted as though um, 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 you, you punched in your clock and like, here's my 40 hours? Do you not understand how much of a miracle it is? Mercy necessitates, I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it, I shouldn't have got it, but because God is loving and kind and gracious and good and outstanding and awesome and everlasting and unending, his grace knows no bounds. Gosh, I want to be around Christians like that. That every time you touch them, Jesus comes out. He saved us how? Through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Teenagers, the minute you say yes to Jesus, you begin to participate in the very life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls that regeneration. I call it grace. The Bible says new creation. I call it mercy. The Bible says you become united to Christ. I call it a good, good father. Whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ. Guys, you know what poured out means? It means Jesus got one of those big Stanley cups like the women in Ballantyne be having. They're like this big. They're like bigger than a fourth grader. <laughs> Lo, you don't want me to tell about that, do you? Okay, I'm not. He just generously poured it out. God doesn't give us droplets of grace. He pours out grace so that having been, this is a past action with future and present implications. That's where it's written in the Greek language. But justified means to be declared righteous by his grace. The God of grace declares us righteous. Would you and I please, would we begin to see what God sees? You're like, pastor, but I'm not righteous. That's the point. That's what makes grace so amazing is you don't earn it. It's given as a gift. And the more you see the gift, the more you want to follow the one who gave you the gift. Did you catch what I said? Listen, some of you think, well, if I read the Bible more, do you know demons know the Bible? Some of the meanest, most ungodly people I know know the Bible. It's knowing the God of the Bible who's gracious. I mean, I, I love reading the Bible, but if I read the Bible without the intent of connecting with Christ, all I did is gave myself biblical knowledge. And how are we made righteous, family? By his grace. We, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Here, here, here's five truths from here of God's grace. One, love and kindness. We get mercy. We, we, we become new. We become righteous. And we have the hope of eternal life, which is a, I know eternal life is not somewhere we go. It's the disposition of our souls in relationship to the eternal God of the universe. And I got time to be thinking about my sorry self. I'd be depressed too if I thought about myself all day. <laughs> For those who have ears, let them hear. It's hard to love yourself correctly if you don't think about what Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection. The fuel to your growth is not doing more. It's receiving more. One of the questions I get all the time, Pastor, how do you grow? How do you grow? Oh, yeah, you read, you pray. But in the heartbeat of that is, I cannot believe his grace. Lastly, teenagers, put this in your heart. And those of you who have yet to follow Christ, put this in your heart. Feasting on grace means this, Jesus graces us so we can leave our life of sin. Watch this. At this, those who heard <laughs> began to go away one at a time. So picture this the scene. You got all these religious leaders, woman caught in adultery, and they're just dropping rocks, and they're just walking away. What looked like it was going to be a massacre of not only her, but of Jesus, turns into a table 
of grace. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. By the way, Jesus loves to stand with us alone when grace kicks condemnation out of the room. So, Jesus is here. He straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? I love the questions Jesus asked. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? Look what she says, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Let's pause here. The secular progressive left, oh, they love that Jesus. He don't condemn anybody. And the fundamentalist right, love the law, Jesus. And they miss it. He's the law giver, but the one who gives grace to the law breaker because he was on a cross in our place to give us grace to create space in his family. Now watch this. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, some of us may, may, may be going, surely he's going to tell her, like, um, put a program on your computer so you don't watch porn. Ain't nothing wrong with that if that's what you do. Um, put these rules in place and, and, and um, uh, do this. And, and, and No, 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 no. He, he, goes, he goes, go and sin no more. Leave that life because of the grace that, that, that you've gotten. That's what grace does, family. That's what grace does is you think about all that you've done and it is overwhelmed by all that Christ has done and you go, I want to follow you and obey you because I don't deserve this grace. Our life as followers of Christ is one in which we say, I don't deserve it. I don't earn it. Hell is what I deserve, but I got heaven instead. Condemnation is what I deserve, but I got acceptance instead. I deserve this honor and what I got was mercy. That's how we grow. Now, the scene of the crime is your mind. 30 minutes from now, you're going to go out in the world and the inner critic going to come back. Man, you don't believe that. That might work for him, but that'll never work for you. When those conversations come, be like, shut up. Ain't even going there today. Nope. And you begin to preach to yourself. I'm going to let this wash over us as we conclude this message and get ready to pray and worship again. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. I remember memorizing this in about the year 2000. It was just blew me away. Look what grace does. Grace, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Grace is not a passport to sinning. It is a highway to holiness. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, now watch this, who gave himself for us, that's the cross, to redeem us, that's the cross, from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good, that's the Holy Spirit's power. So notice what God's grace does. Transformation Church. There's a big table and there's grace on every plate for all of us. And when we sit down on the table, he talks to all of us as though it's just one of us. He's not too busy to hear you. He's not distracted by his iPhone or his Android in my case. And he says, sit and eat, then go and sin no more and come back tomorrow. <laughs> There's more where this came from. Will you pray with me?
Holy Spirit, thank you so much for the gift of grace. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is spelled G-R-A-C-E, grace. May we feast on grace as a congregation and give that grace away to those who don't know Jesus. But right now, I want to pray for those of you who are saying, hey, Pastor Derwin, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I'm ready to be forgiven. I'm ready to be made new. I'm ready to experience what you experienced. I need to be set free. I'm ready to be redeemed. I'm ready to follow Jesus. If that's you right now, whether if you are at home or in this building, wherever you are right now, if you're ready to follow Jesus and give your life to him, I want you to say this in the silence of your heart today, King Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that on that bloody cross, it should have been me, but it was you because of grace. Your blood makes me righteous. Your blood forgives me. Your blood is merciful. Your grace is amazing. I receive forgiveness and I believe that on the third day when you rose again, you rose to new life in me to make me a part of your family. I am eternally yours and you are eternally mine and I choose to follow you and feast at your table of grace. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? What I would like for us to do, um, if you prayed that prayer with me and you gave your life to Jesus, there's a physical connection card and I want you to take some time before the service is over to fill out that connection card and check, I pray to receive Christ. If you don't have a physical connection card, there's a QR code on the seat in front of you. Open up your camera app on your smartphone. That'll take you to our connection page online. You can do the same thing as well with the QR code But please let us know you pray to receive Christ. We make that a big deal. We want to celebrate that with you. All right? Well, family, here's our soul tattoo. For those of you new to the TC family, soul tattoo means what's the idea to to set in my heart all week? Here it is, feast on grace. What does that mean practically? Listen to the sermon over and over. Do the study questions on the website. Get in a TC group. Get in a small group. Let it get all up in your soul. Feast on grace like you at Papa Do's. <laughs> Papa Do's going to bring one here. Here's our action step, family. Our action step is this. On March 17th, if you've not been baptized, sign up to be baptized. Baptism is a sacred symbol that shows externally what happened internally. When you're baptized, you go down under the water. That symbolizes dying with Christ. When you come up, that symbolizes new life with Christ. When you're baptized, that doesn't save you, but it does show that you are saved. This wedding ring I wear for 31 years doesn't make me married, but it shows the world I'm taken. I belong to Queen Vicky. You know what I'm saying? So when you're baptized, it shows the world I belong to King Jesus. If you were baptized when you were young and it didn't mean anything, to you, sign up to be baptized as a believer. Also, we want you to participate in the market. We feed about 400 families every single month. We're not a church that's going to complain. We're going to roll up our sleeves and do gospel work. So, I want all of us to get involved. Would you stand up? We're going to thank Jesus for his blood. And I want you to sing the song like Jesus really did something for you. Love you guys. <laughs>